2016, our president and provost noticed that there was health research happening in every college at Texas State. And so I was fortunate enough to be asked to sort of find a way and connect people who were doing similar work who might be in different colleges or different departments. So the Health Scholar Showcase started in 2017. We try to avoid the really long and boring presentations. And instead, we have people stand with posters that reflect their research in a way that allows others to engage with them about it. Because our goal is to build relationships. And in our run to the Research One status from the Carnegie Foundation, we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to take part in our future as a research university. The research poster that we are presenting here today at the showcase is not a typical research presentation. What we are sharing is how we have developed the GRIT Awards, G-R-I-T, which stands for Great Resilience in Texas, how we've developed that awards program acknowledging small businesses for their resilience across the state. So the Translational Health Research Center has now been going here at Texas State for several years. All of our faculty are working uh, collaboratively, interdisciplinary. They're really doing things from the biological sciences, to engineering, to the health professions college, which I'm in, to nutrition, to uh, the College of Education, uh, just biochemistry, they're really crossing all specters. So this event has already created me with a great, great opportunity to introduce my research project to other researchers at Texas State. And also it set up the platform for me to get to know their project as well. As a faculty fellow with THRC for the last year, it's been really great. The biggest thing that it's helped me with is dissemination of our findings because you know, it's one thing to do these studies and publish them in an academic journal, but this group has really helped me with dissemination and sharing the findings of these studies to a larger population. The main outcome of this research is to present what I'm currently working on uh, and get feedback. It's important to get feedback, so I'm very excited about this event because I'm getting really good feedback and I can in incorporate that you know, with my co-authors, you know, in the paper and research. This Health Scholar Showcase that Melinda Villagran runs is something that features, it's one of the premier events of our university that features health-related research from across the institution. I looked at the posters uh, that our faculty are, have presented and the singular goal that I saw in each one of them is research with relevance. So each one of these projects makes a difference to people outside of the university, the general public, the citizens of Texas, the citizens of the United States and the world. People do research because there's a fire in the belly. They have a passion towards it. And whatever obstacle that comes in their way, including a global pandemic, our faculty, our researchers will persist in trying to accomplish their research mission. As the director of the Translational Health Research Center, I'm always pleased to host the Health Scholar Showcase because it's the flagship event of our center. It's not a place where people just present their research. Instead, at this event, they get to have dialogue about their research and they get to learn from other people who do similar work. So the discussions and the relationships that come from this event each year pay off for the rest of the time until we have another showcase. You know, this is the premier research event of the university, uh, but it also is a place where faculty from across various disciplines that normally wouldn't work together are brought together under the aegis of uh, the Translational Health Research Center with funding provided to them so that they can be successful researchers as they start out their career here at Texas State. So that's fantastic. So congratulations to all of you who make this happen. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Kerry Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson serves as the Chief Engagement Officer for the All of Us program at the National Institutes for Health. So All of Us is a historic effort by the NIH 
to collect and study data from one million or more diverse people living in the United States. And the program seeks to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. Particularly here at Texas State, I was just talking to Dr. Watson before we started, you know, the demographics of our student population reflect the demographics of Texas. So we are a very diverse campus. We are a very welcoming campus. And all of us, to excuse the pun, benefit from the amazing work that the National Institutes of Health is doing in recognizing that there is a need to look at genetic data and other data from diverse populations to provide therapies and healthcare for all of us. So Dr. Watson has a doctorate in health science and global health uh, from NOAA uh, Southeastern University, a master of science in basic medical research, a master's in public health uh, from the University of Illinois. He served as a principal investigator on multiple projects, including those funded by the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the All of Us Research Program. His expertise in community academic partnerships is also supported in his role as the board chair of the Community Campus Partnerships for Health. His contributions have heard in recognition by the Chicago Urban League, American Heart Association, the Longevity Foundation, and others. So I could keep go on and on talking about Dr. Watson, but I would like to welcome him to stage now. Thank you so much. I always get embarrassed with intros and bios um, because I, I figure that no one really wants them but my parents and um, wants to hear about that. But I'm so excited to be here today. Thank you all for the invitation. Congratulations on what you all have been able to accomplish thus far. Um, I was really excited. I did get a chance to do a brief perusal at some of the posters and I got excited. I, you know, it was a long drive from Houston. I'm actually located in the Chicagoland area. But, and, and had a site visit at Baylor College of Medicine yesterday and then came here, drove here this morning. So I'm really excited about this. And so I'm gonna spend the next 30 minutes or so talking to you all about the All of Us Research Program. Then we're gonna engage in a Q&A discussion as well. So I'm more involved in the, and I'm more excited about the Q&A than I am my presentation. So I wanna make sure that we get time to have a real robust conversation. So today I hope to introduce the All of Us Research Program to you to discuss the importance of precision medicine research, particularly in advancing translational science through community engagement by including populations who've been historically underrepresented by medical research. And lastly, I wanna highlight how scientists can utilize the All of Us Research Workbench. And I can't stress enough the importance of sparking an interest in science at an early age. I too got my first spark as an undergraduate student. I still remember the project. I still remember the hamsters that I let a couple go. Um, and I realized that I cost a lot of money to that researcher because I didn't know that she had to go through an animal research approval process at that time. That I later found out that I cost her some money, but she still wrote me a letter, letter of gratitude. Um, so I did something right. And I remember my, my summer research opportunity program, my SROP research opportunity program. And I, t I tell my students when I was a faculty at the University of Illinois in Chicago, I tell my students, never burn a bridge because you're going to need letters. And, and, and the community of scientists, although big and vast, is still kind of small. And I said, so you're going to run into someone at an institution. I'm going to know them. and They're going to ask me about you. Uh, and because I said, I've benefited from that same type of platform. And, and what is the NIH All of Us Research Program? I could tell you in this slide, because my team put together this slide, and it's really amazing. It talks about 2015, January 2015, then President Obama signed into, um, got excited about Precision Medicine Initiative and talked about the Cures Act. I can tell you everything that happened in December 2016 and sign this into law, or I could actually get personal and tell you my family history and tell you how, it's, how it impacts me. So when I think about precision medicine, how medicine has not always been precise for everyone. It first starts with my own family history when I was six years old. My birth mother died from complications of breast cancer. My parents are from the South, and they came up North like many African Americans did in the, in, the, in the 60s at the time, and they came up North to have different opportunities that they didn't have in the South. And I'm the youngest of nine kids. And so when my mother was in her late 40s and started having some pains in her chest, and she went to the doctor in this small rural town in Michigan, Muskegon Heights, Michigan, um, we didn't have a big academic medical center in my hometown. So she went to her primary care doctor. And back then, it was the early 80s, right? You know, the way that you do, you know, she wasn't up for an MRI. She had just had, you know, twins, you know, several years before. So it's probably nothing. No, it was something. It was breast cancer. 
And she went on, unfortunately, to have a double mastectomy and other things as a result of that breast cancer. And at the time, research had not caught up to her care. Research had not caught up to the health disparity that she was experiencing. And I understand what it's like when your zip code can be more important than your genetic code determining your health outcome. So fast forward, my dad is, I grew up in the African-American church as well, Pentecostal specifically, and so my dad was not gonna be a single deacon in that church for too long. So my dad gets married two years later, now my new mom gets cancer, breast cancer. But my dad learned something in my new mom's diagnosis of breast cancer that I later ended up researching on. My dad became a patient navigator. He didn't call himself that. He didn't know that he was doing patient navigation. He didn't know that he was increasing his health literacy. Those are all things that I studied about later on, but that's what he was doing. He knew questions to ask in this new, this new time when his new wife, the new mother of his children, because we don't use the word step in my home because there's nothing step about my new mom. And so I got introduced to this concept that your health outcome can be different just by asking some different questions. Now fast forward, several years later, I'm at the University of Michigan studying pre-med, pre-biology major and everything, and I get a call, my dad has colon cancer. I'm like, this cancer thing keeps coming up. I don't like it, right? And so I'm like, I gotta have to do something about this cancer thing because I really hate it. And so my dad gets colon cancer, but he's also had diabetes, he has some complications, but he goes on to live a really a good life. But lo and behold, unfortunately, 10 years later, the cancer didn't come back, but the treatment that he had at the time, the lack of precision medicine caused it to have some bowel obstruction and some complications due to some pain medications. Medicine wasn't precise for him. And my dad died from complications of his colon cancer and untreated diabetes. And my oldest brother gets colon cancer, in addition to his kidney transplant that he had. So now I'm scared, to be honest with you, because I'm a researcher now. I'm a graduate student, and my oldest brother gets colon cancer. I know enough to know that I should be scared, but I also have this faith background to know that we can't live in fear. I'm confused. And so I said, what can I do about this? So I started learning about precision medicine. I started learning about ways to get communities that are at elevated risk for cancer, to get them screened for cancer, based on not just this one size fits all approach, not that everyone should go get screened because of this, this blanket prescription for screening and this screening everyone the same way, it would not work because it would not have worked for my family. Because had my brother got screened on time, they would have caught his cancer five years later because he was first diagnosed before the age of 50. And the recommendations said he should have been screened at 50. Medicine was not precise for my brother. And it was not precise for him in May of 2021 when he passed away from complications of colon cancer to recurrence because guess what? There was no AI algorithm, machine learning algorithm that could determine what level of chemotherapy he needed that wouldn't further damage his kidneys. Medicine was not precise for him, but it was precise for my new mom because in, in, she, in January of 2018 or so, she got diagnosed with lung cancer, stage four lung cancer. Threw me for a loop, because I'm a what? A cancer disparities researcher at this time. My research sat at the intersection of cancer screening, cancer prevention, and cancer control. Threw me for a loop because I was doing a lung cancer screening at the time. I was getting, getting ready to write for a big R01 application, this new precision medicine initiative. My mother gets lung cancer, stage four, and she's never a smoker, never worked in an environmental impact around this. And the first thing that the physicians asked her every time we went to get screened was, have you smoked? You know? and, and she would answer the question, but they wouldn't believe her. And at some point, she started telling them, you know, my son's a doctor. And you know, she started giving her resume out. And as an African-American woman, she shouldn't have had to do that just to be heard. She shouldn't have to walk out her a resume of her children and say how successful her children are and threaten to call me. Who, and my son knows a lot of people. I was like, would you stop telling people that when you go to the doctor? <laughs> I was like, you kind of stop. Like, my son knows that. I was like, first of all, I don't know the director of the NIH. Like, I know them, but not know them. I was like, so stop saying that. Like, but, but she was really proud. And long story short, we end up getting, she ended up getting diagnosed with lung stage four lung cancer. And right before they went to treat her with a chemotherapy, I said, time out. I actually do know a lot of people. And I'm going to make some calls. So before you treat my mom with this blanket approach to chemotherapy, let me do some molecular target testing of her tumor. We don't have that here. I know, we're gonna send her labs out to some places because guess what, I know people. <laughs> we sent her tumor out, her testing, sent her tumors out, got testing, and lo and behold, she qualified for a new EGRF drug that was just, just newly on the market. It's actually my, yeah, it was, it's just got on the market. We get her the medication, insurance company says, we may or may not pay for it, thank God we're privileged. And I don't mean privileged, we're not rich by any stretch of the imagination. I had to move some things around to go pay for that medication. 
so that while the insurance company is trying to make up their mind on whether or not they would give it to her, she would get it. That's privilege. Everyone does not have that ability, right? Everyone does not have the ability to call three different cancer center directors and say, can you look at my mom's scan? Can call chairs of, and you should not have to just to get good care. So if I say, what is all of us? All of us is trying to do the opposite of what has happened in the history. All of us is trying to make sure that your care can be based on your individual genetic risk factors. Your care can be based on your ancestry. Your care can be based on your zip code and where you live. And we will take your individuality into account when we think about the care that you need. That's what all of us is doing, setting out to collect data from a million or more people so that we can advance science and eliminate healthcare disparities. Now, although my new mom went on to pass away from lung cancer, she had an amazing journey because her quality of life was improved by the type of drug that we were able to give her. And she went in hospice care later on, totally different outcome than my oldest brother. So that's what precision medicine is, and that's what really drives me to do this work. So I felt my personal story could tell you a little bit more about my why than where we are today. Now, where are we with the All of Us Research Program? Our goal, some, like, some research programs ask questions like, is drug X better than drug Y? Is this treatment better than this treatment? We're not actually asking those types of questions to all of us. Our goal is to actually collect data from a million or more people and then make that data readily available to researchers like many of you in the audience so that you can use our data to ask questions that you otherwise would not be able to ask. When you think about where that data comes from, Texas is represented. Over 16,000 participants come from the state of Texas because of our enrollment sites and our partnerships in Texas. To date, we have over 767,000 participants, over 425,000 electronic health records, over 527,000 participants who have completed the initial steps of the program, and biosamples from over 500,000 participants. And that map demonstrates that every state is blue on this map in U.S. territories because we have been intentional and we have enrolled partners from all across the U.S. and the U.S. territories truly reflecting the diversity of the U.S. And when we think about the diversity of the U.S., I want to point to you these two pie charts here. The pie chart on the bottom is other genomic studies. That big blue does not, is not what the world looks like. It's not what, what, the, what Texas looks like. It's not what the U.S. looks like. Most genomic data that we had prior to all of us did not reflect the diversity of the U.S. And what does that mean in terms of this idea called generalizability? That means when I think about taking that data from that bottom pie chart and trying to develop algorithms from that data, trying to think about what disparities may exist, what mutations may exist in that data, that's not reflective of the US. That pie, top pie chart is where all of us has enrolled over 3.2% Asian American, 16.5% um, African American, Hispanic and Latino at 60%, Middle Eastern, Northern African, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander 2.7%, and then white 52.5% prefer not to answer. And we acknowledge this concept that race is a social construct. We acknowledge that. However, we understand that even as a social construct, it's important to collect that information and compare that information to what we know about ancestry and other things. But we don't just stop there. When we think about populations who've been historically underrepresented in research, we also know that research is a privilege in and of itself. So historically, research studies include populations that get their care at big academic medical centers, the big names, right? And they also include populations that have a higher socioeconomic status, insurance, and very rarely do they include populations that are living with disability, even though in the US, one in four people are likely living with a disability. They definitely don't include populations that live in rural communities. Why? Because most of our research studies are done at academic institutions that are not in those rural communities. So the fact that we have almost 10% of our participants from the rural areas of the US, 10% of our participants are sexual gender minorities, 20%, so one in five of our participants is living with a disability. One in four of our participants has an income less than 25,000. One in four of our participants over the age of 65, because guess what? America's getting older. America's getting younger too, but people are living longer, thank God, and living healthier lives. The, old, the closer I get to getting the AAP, ARP card, the more I want us to have better research and better things, innovations for people as we get older. And so when I think about our, our intentional efforts, we've done this through partnerships. Scientific impact. So what has been the impact of the All of Us Research Program today? This is just a few of the papers I want to highlight. So looking at racial differences in length of stay and readmission for asthma in the All of Us Research Program. I saw a poster that reminded me of this. There was one poster that talked about fall. There was one poster that talked about um, 
debt and the, the amount of the income that you have can determine you know, your hospital stay and other things. You all are asking questions that you can also use our data set to ask questions about. I was so excited to see the, the heterogeneity of the research questions that are asked. You think about investigation of hypertension and type 2 diabetes risk factors for dementia in the All of Us Research Program. So imagine that paper having the access to the diverse data it had and then looking at that paper and also being able to get three digit zip code level data to compare that. I was talking to a computer, one, of the, one of the faculty earlier, the researchers, talking about utilizing our data to look at mental health and well-being outcomes and being able to compare that data at three digit zip code data with data from other states to see are there some hidden health disparities that we may not be aware of because of the size and diversity of our data. We recently found out that we are the, the largest, one of the world's largest secondary data sets for sexual and gender minorities, for population that identifies LGBTQIA+. So imagine being able to have research and data that can address questions that never been able to be asked before. Now, how do we do this? Now, as a community, as the chief of engagement, my role is I'm trained as a community-based, in community-based participatory research, we call CBPR. That meant that the research that I did was always informed by the community. I worked with community clinics, federally qualified health centers. I worked with doulas, community health workers. I worked with barbershops. I worked with pastors, faith leaders. One of the largest projects I had was actually with some barbers on the south side of Chicago, where we worked with those barbers to collect hair samples from them, then test the cortisol levels in those hair samples to compare stress levels to see if men who had elevated levels of stress, what zip code they lived in, how they answered the ACE questionnaire, adverse childhood experience questionnaire, how they answered the social determinants of health questionnaire, and then other questionnaire and surveys that we developed if they were at elevated risk for lung cancer, if they smoked. Because it's not just smoking alone, it's smoking with the other factors that impact that. We did that study on the south side of Chicago, enrolled 161 men. We beat the enrollment. Why? Because I had trusted relationships in the community. It was working with those barbers. Those barbers had the trusted relationship with those participants, their customers. So it was nothing, for, not nothing. It took a lot of work. But I was there in that community before I did the research. I was there in the community doing the research. And I've been there in that community after the research is done. Those barbers can call me today and say, Kareem, I need you to come to the barbershop and just sit here and just answer some questions because people have questions about the vaccine. We did that during the pandemic. When I stopped my research study, I went to that barbershop, sat, sat there with my mask, and I passed out masks and talked about how barbers are a great way to do this because they've been doing antiseptic work for a long time. And we talked about that, and I was able to do that because I built a relationship there. I had partnerships there. And that's what drip led my research, and that's what we're trying to do with the All of Us Research Program, our engagement ecosystem. We have over 18 national engagement partners that sit in my in my shop where we talk about the importance of the American Association of Health and Disabilities, one of our partners, Baylor College of Medicine, where I was yesterday, Asian Health Coalition, Delta Research Education Foundation, which is called DREF. DREF is the second, is the non-for-profit research arm of the second oldest African-American sorority in the country. It is so vital to have a partner like DREF at the table because they have a trusted legacy in the community. So when I come in in that partnership with DREF, I get Trust by proxy. Now I have to keep that trust, but that trust is already there because they say, huh, Dreft's at the table with you all. Y'all must be doing something right. National Alliance of Hispanic Health, one of our largest and most robust partners. And the list goes on and on. The work that we're doing with the University of Arizona has been so rewarding as an HSI institution and the work that we're doing there. And Arizona, University of Arizona actually has another partnership with Arizona State where they have actually one of our largest registrants of researchers why? Because one faculty in the school there at Arizona State uses our data, our workbench, to teach one of her, school, her epidemiology and biostats classes. She actually uses our workbench, registers her students, and they interrogate our data set as part of their learning. They use it in capstones. It's awesome. And so I'm fortunate enough to lead this amazing group of 18 national partners. Even our consortium here in Texas, you can make these familiar names, Baylor Scott and White. Um, the uh, MAUC, UT Health San Antonio, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Bank. And then our national community partners here that work with all of these big health centers to help us collect data and engage the community to enroll. Now, as a community engaged scientist, I don't believe that community engagement has to just be a big health fair. You invite people to that health fair, you pass out brochures. Engagement is actually a science too. I tell some of my basic science peers that that engagement is a science. And I kept telling them this and they weren't hearing me as much as, I, as loudly as I wanted to. So I adapted the ecological model, because why? I'm trained in public health, and we use ecological models. So I adapted this ecological model to show them how we do engagement. 
There's a, there's a method to our madness. Kareem is not just going out to that event, that, that workshop and gonna do this. Actually, Kareem is going there so he can be seen, he can make a re relationship. He can find out what the community needs. He's gonna then come back to the table and find a partner who's already there in the community because I don't get the luxury of probably staying there. For me to come in and go out, that's actually gonna be more harmful than not being there. So we do outreach and awareness where we're reaching a lot of people. Then education and access where we're actually measuring pre and post data. Did what we do make a difference? Did our, did our discussion cause people to change their minds about how they feel about clinical trials? We then do enrollment and retention to think about, okay, now that we've done this outreach and awareness, we've done an education and access, we've talked about how you can get to us, then we talk about how you enroll with us. But we don't stop there. Our participants become our partners. We have recently published a paper that all of us participants are actually involved in several places of our governance structure. They're on our IRB. They're on our publications review board. They're on our study team to help us develop ancillary studies and review. Of. They're on our survey development team. So participants who have actually donated their data get the opportunity to help inform the direction where our program goes. And then we mobilize knowledge. Um, I, again, I recently published a paper from some of the lung cancer work that we did with Barbers in Chicago. And we have a family chat. I put in the family chat, oh, I published a paper, I put the link in there, nothing. I got no, you know you can tell who's read it, nobody read it. My sister put something in there about an upcoming um, shower, baby shower that my niece was having. Everybody read that. I was like, everybody know I'm getting a new nephew, but no one knows that I just published this paper. Because my family doesn't read my publications. Right? Surprise. So, and most community members, I hate to break it to you, most community members are not going to read our publications. So that amazing breakthrough that we have, that, that groundbreaking thing that we want to get out there, we want to disseminate, is it the best way to disseminate it to the community through a publication? Probably not. So when I was at the University of Illinois Chicago, I used to have community town hall forums to talk about the outcomes of my research, where I would bring participants back to the setting where they enrolled and talk to them about what I found. And I would send them an email called, because of you. I would say, because of you, I know this. We know this about prostate cancer screening that we would not have known if you hadn't enrolled in this study. And it was really a cool concept, and we wanted to bring that to the All of Us Research Program. So we call it knowledge mobilization. Yes, we publish. Yes, we present at conferences. But we also mobilize knowledge in unique and different ways. We, and I'll show you some of those in this next slide. This is how we operationalize. I want to start at the bottom, actually, with knowledge mobilization. Dr. Elizabeth Cohn at, um, used to be at Columbia University. Now she's at Northwell Health. Dr. Cohn holds, holds what's called data sandbox workshops, where she goes into Harlem, goes into communities in New York, and she actually holds workshops and walk community members through our data set and say, hey, did you know all of us has this much information about asthma? Did you know they have this much information about social terms of health? What do you think about this? What questions would you like for researchers to ask about that? Then Dr. Cohen brings that information back to us. That's an example of knowledge mobilization. Participants as partners. Um, we have in 2023, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health recommended two Hispanic and Latino participant ambassadors for the All of Us Research Work Group that are now very active with us in our leadership program. Then enrollment is, and retention. So like I said, we work with DREF, but we also work with the Black Greek Letter Consortium, the Cobb Institute, which is affiliation of National Medical Association and the National Black Nurse Association, an example. And, and Texas, in 2023 at the Black, Texas Black Expo, we had over 575 people, not just stop by our table, but we have a thing called real engagement. Or you don't, if you don't just stop by the table, we actually measure the, what the conversation you have, and we ask you, was it impactful? That happened right here in Texas with over 180 baseline enrollments and 42 webinar, webinar sessions. And then we had education and access. Haku's 37th annual conference allowed us to talk about the importance and information of creating the next generation of researchers utilizing our data from communities that carry the greatest burden disease. And then outreach and awareness. Unidos US has a large reach on social media, including areas near Texas state. And also since July 23, Unidos has worked on social media ads that will generate at least 6,500 web visits, web page users resulting in at least 30 account creations. This is how we operationalize our ecological model of engagement. And we recently published a paper on this, so if you want to, I would encourage you to utilize this model. It's a great way to request funding for community engagement because we can show that there can be impact to community engagement. The importance of listening. I can't stress enough how important it is to listen to community and create spaces where you can listen. So one of the things when I took this job, I took this job with the understanding in the back of my head, I have to do something in Alabama. I have to do something in Tuskegee, Alabama. I can, as an African-American scientist, whose parents are from the South, where my, who I cannot in good conscience think that 
the United States Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the African American male, that that was not going to come up because it comes up for me. It came up with my family when I told them I wasn't going to go to the medical route, I was going to go into research. One of the first things my dad said, who was still living at the time, was, so you're going to do research on, on people? I said, no, I'm going to do research with and for people. But he said research on people because that's where his mindset was because that's where, what usually happens. Think about the language you have to use in the compliance document. We have to have to call people participants subjects. Think about what that means, right? And what, that, what, kind of, what the tenor that sets. So I knew that I couldn't do what I wanted to do without addressing this head on. So I made a call. I picked up the phone and I called the woman in the red, Miss Lily Head. She has an organization called Safe, um, Stories of Our Fathers. Her father was one of the last surviving participants in the United States Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the African-American male. I'm saying that mouthful of the name and not calling it the Tuskegee experiment because calling it the Tuskegee experiment puts the onus on Tuskegee. And it doesn't acknowledge that that study was done, conducted, and funded by the United States government. Okay, let that marinate on that. So now, the, then, so then the government wants to come and we, we want to ask people to participate and we're not going to acknowledge what we've done in, in people's lifetime that are still living, and that's not going to work too well. So we went and we had a community convening, over 300 people and over 1,600 views on our YouTube link that's still up with the great granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks, Veronica Robinson in blue, a, and a bioethicist in Tuskegee to talk about the impact of what that meant, but to talk about, yes, acknowledge and name and claim, yes, this happened, but we got to move forward. Because if we're not participating in this study, research is going to move on without us, advances will move on without us. And one of the fears that my mentor had, Dr. Robert Wynn, who I did my postdoc with, Dr. Wynn was one of the first African-American cancer directors at a comprehensive cancer center. Dr. Wynn said, Kareem, we have to make sure that precision medicine doesn't, does not widen inequities, does not create more inequities. Because if we're not careful, precision medicine will be just for some. And so it'll be some of us and not all of us. So I always have him in the back of my mind. And then we also had to go address this and how research shows up for Hispanic and Latino communities as well. So we went to San Diego, to the Chicano Mexican community there, to talk head on about the environmental injustices that are happening in that community and how we need to have more research that collects environmental health data to think about the pollutants that the population are exposed to. Gentrification in certain neighborhoods is bringing in diseases and exposures that are not happening in other neighborhoods. Through gentrification in the in the California area, more minoritized populations are moving closer to the highway system, being exposed to some of that exhaust and all the other pollutants, whereas privileged populations are moving more insular, being away from the highway system. So we had to have that conversation and have it head on. And we engage our audiences through research and engagement by thinking about five primary audiences. We start as early as K through 12, go to high school undergraduate students, postdoc, early stage investigators, established investigators, and even community and citizen scientists. And we've been able to achieve a lot of this work by making sure we have intentional partnerships with HBCUs, historically black college universities, which HSIs, Hispanic Service Institutions. And you'll see in our last group of awardees, we awarded Florida Atlantic University, Florida, um, Florida International, Northern Arizona, San Jose State, University of Nevada, and University of Puerto Rico Medical Center also was awarded, making sure we have this intentional engagement. We'd we'll love to see Texas State added to that map and have some intentional conversation with you all about that. And this is just some of the work that DREF has done for us in National Alliance. DREF has a program called the, DREF, the Delta 22, where I get to meet with 22 scientists that are from various different disciplines across medicine, research, to talk about how they can use the All of Us data set to advance research. We also work with the National Alliance for Hispanic Health to create what is called um, All of Us Ambassadors. They have 15 universities with, through, um, and with five of them are HSIs engaging over 9,000 researchers. That's through the network. So I love your model of taking the resources and spreading it out. It works, you all. It really does. And then this is an example of some of the research that has taken place. I want to draw your attention to the researchallofus.org RSP because in August of 2024, I would love to make sure we stay in touch so that you all can sign up and learn about our research scholars program and learn about how you can get access to a mentor and research opportunities utilizing our data set. And this is from one of our previous scholars in California. She said, my time as an All of Us research scholar helped me realize the importance of diversity in research, especially as a woman and young researcher. She's from our 2023 um, research cohort. And her project was looking at ethnicity, association, and metformin use and triple negative breast cancer phenotypes. That's amazing, right? 
What type of data do we have? I'm getting ready to close. Over 400,000 survey responses. This includes an amazing survey on social determinants of health. Our social determinants of health survey is one of the most robust social determinants of health surveys I've ever seen because it has 26 measures that, 27 measures that we look at, including spirituality, religion, including experiences in the healthcare system. So imagine coupling someone's response. Say, imagine you have a participant who said, a cohort of participants that said, this number of participants had a bad experience with the healthcare system. I look in their EHR and I say, of those who had a bad experience, X percentage of them have not been com compliant with guideline concordant screening for mammograms. And of that number, this is how many have a BRCA mutation. You can answer those types of questions with our data set because we have EHR, survey data, and biological samples within our data set. And this allows you to, the way you get access to this data is through, we have a public tier that's available to anyone where it's a lot of um, aggregated data. This gives you what we call data snapshots. And also at that public tier, we have a project directory that if you have a research idea, you want to say, hey, I have a question. I want to develop this topic. You can go to our research directory and, and search and see if there's anyone else doing something similar. And if you don't see it, we encourage you then to become a registered user where your institution must have a Dura in place. And if you all don't, we can easily get you one. And if your institution, as soon as your institution gets that Dura, you can get in our, and I know you all have a Dura already, I already checked. So you all have a Dura in place so your research can get on the workbench and I already use that. And then they, that's where you get access to the register tier, that survey data, EHR data, physical measurements, even wearable data. Then at the control tier, which requires an additional level of training, where you get access to the genomic data and the health and lifestyle surveys. Another paper, because of the size and diversity of our data set, we are now able to address questions like revisiting the Latino epidemiological paradox and analysis of data from the All of Us Research Program. This has been stumbling re researchers for years because the data sets have been so small with Hispanic and Latino participants that we haven't really been able to disentangle what are true cardiovascular risk factors in certain populations. This is a team at the University of Miami looking at age-adjusted cardiovascular disease prevalence for males and females by racial ethnic groups. Another study by a student, Demetria Bolden, as undergraduate at Prairie, a and Prairie, um, Prairie View A&M, is looking at, her hypothesis is, if a, Af if a person of African American descent has an income below the federal poverty level, then their risk for developing nephropathy becomes increased due to their lack of access to proper health care. This sounds very similar to a lot of the topics I saw in the poster competition today. We are asking similar, similar questions that you all have interest in. And what she found so far is that um, black or African Americans are more than three times as likely as Hispanic or Latinos to have kidney failure compared to white Americans when she looked at our data set. Another researcher is looking at using the All of Us data set to study cancer risk in more than 60,000 participants who self-report as Hispanic or Latino or Spanish. And what they found is the prevalence of primary liver cancer is affected by place of birth for, for Hispanic people living in the United States. The All of Us research program showed this. And I want you to think about this QR code, to think about logging on, see how you can become a part, learn more about the All of Us research convention that's getting ready to take place. And this is how you can learn about how we want to partner with us to drive health equity forward. And this is how you can get in touch with me. And so with that said, I now want to turn the floor back over and open it up for some questions. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Wilson. Um, I'm so glad that uh, you talk uh, this uh, related council. So I'm a PhD student of a geography department. So my research interest, my dissertation focuses on land council. That's <laughs> you gave me a good, good lesson for me. So my question, what? What's the main problem? What do you want, uh, like a PhD, uh, researchers for like lung cancer, do in future? Like, uh, what's the research interest want uh, like a lung cancer researcher focus? 
it's a great question. So the question was around what would I recommend as some research interests and top, emerging topics for a PhD or graduate student looking at lung cancer research. And I would say look at it from a team science approach that really work, it's gonna, com, it's gonna re require our basic scientists to partner with our population health researchers, even to populate, um, combine with our you know, computer scientists for algorithms. One of the ways that I see lung cancer advancing is to think about ancestry as well. To think about are certain populations at risk for any mutations that may exist that, that may be caused by stress or other fact, risk factors. Um, and, and if those mutations are showing up in one population more than another. Another is to really still, lung cancer, most of the majority of them are still caused by tobacco use. So we also have to examine this, this concept of the tobacco use. And from a population health perspective, knowing that different communities are exposed to different types of tobacco products. You think about flavored cigarettes, you think about menthol and the addictive properties of menthol versus, the, the, versus other cigarettes and how there's policies in place that certain communities don't even have advertised for menthol cigarettes, but some communities do, right? So those are some of the emerging places for lung cancer. And then access to low dose CT is another big area for the future. We know that when the National Lung Screening Trial came out, it showed a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality for people who got a low dose CT screen for that. And as a result, they came out with screening, risk, uh, screening guidelines. But unfortunately, those guidelines didn't, come, they didn't, they weren't generalizable to the population that I treated and saw in the federally qualified health center where I worked and did most of my research. Those guidelines were made on a population that included only 4.4% African Americans, yet African American men carried the greatest burden of lung cancer disparities. So in the future, gotta think about screening opportunities, using AI, and machine learning to develop screening modalities and screening algorithms. Those are some of the topics. Hope I answered the question. Hi, Karim. It's a great presentation. Um, really touched by all this uh, ecosystem that you're building here. Uh, I'm Lee Fong from uh, Department of Finance Economics. Um, uh, I, it, this reminds me a lot of the sort of in education uh, research we do. You know, we, we say, you know, we're going to build a school, but we build a school, right? You build the infrastructure, but are they going to come, right? Are the students going to come? Are the people who are going to take advantage of all this data that you, uh, all the wonderful data infrastructure that you have built? I, I'm curious about that and how <laughs> you're, like, I know there is a system, but I wanted to, Kind of hear your experience of how to develop that people, uh, the talent behind who can actually take advantage of the data infrastructure that you all are building. Yeah, I'm, I've been on a, thank you so much for that. I'm, I really, I think the gist of the question is how do we ensure that there are students and researchers that may not have, normally have access to this type of data, how do A, we get them aware that this exists and get them excited about it and also make sure they have the, the skills to use it. One of the things I'm doing is, is making sure we talk to programs like this one, talking about the importance of coders with R and Python skills and experience, and make sure that you have the support in place. So we partner with Baylor College of Medicine that actually leads a national program for us, expanding the, the, the access to people that are proficient in R and Python. And you can go to come to office hours by Baylor College of Medicine to learn more about R and Python and how to utilize it. But I'm actually going to be talking to museums and high school STEM programs about teaching coding in high school, making sure that kids become, youth become proficient in R and Python and, and SAS and other coding languages because it's so important. And thinking about where we're going to places that are under-resourced. That slide I showed, we're working with RTI, Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina. We are intentional about going to institutions that are, that are under-resourced, that may not have big computer science programs, that may not have schools of epidemiology and biostatistics and partnering those schools with schools that do have it. And then making sure we do a resource assessment and say what resources are lacking in this place and how do we get it. Last thing I'll say, we partnered with the National Library of Medicine, NLM, to ensure that internet access wasn't a barrier. So in some communities that may not have the bandwidth, you can go to a library that may be partnering with us and get a laptop and get an iPad and do some of the work or enroll in the program through that iPad. I wanted to ask you a question. So I'm a, I'm a genealogist. I'm interested in genealogy. And I, I'm running into these people that, you know, precision medicine offers all of this promise to find out information. 
but people are finding out information about genetics that has implications for their entire family mm -hmm. that they may or may not even know. Mm -hmm. Have you, has anyone thought about this related to, to all of us and how people use the data and counseling or like, is there anything in place that you can think of that other people could emulate? That's a great question. And it, and it really sits in line with this field of research called LC, Ethical and Legal and Scientific Implications of Genetic Research. LC is a whole field of study. And before we launched All of Us, we thought about this a lot. We did 77 community engagement studios with over 600 people before we launched and enrolled our first participant. And this comment, this question came up. So what we did is we partnered with Color, an organization. So every participant in our program who gets, access, who gets their data returned back to them, and if they have actionable finding, because we were very clear that what we return, we didn't just want to return all genetic information, but we want to return information that's actually by the ACMG, the American College of Genetics, did it. it's called actionable findings. So it's about 59 actionable findings. And if you have one of those findings and you want to talk to a genetic counselor, you can do that for free in our program. And our genetic counselors provide counseling in English and in Spanish, but we also have interpretive services across multiple languages. So without fail, not without fail, but every person who gets an actionable finding, if you want to, you can actually talk to a genetic counselor. And I personally had that experience. I was scared when I got my results back because I had genetic testing before, but I was praying that we didn't have this condition called Lynch syndrome. With the fact that my brother had, my brother had lung, um, colon cancer, my dad had colon cancer, and my um, sister had breast cancer, my mother had breast cancer, I was like, I don't want to get a BRC. I don't want to get anything that's going to tell me this back. And I do this work, and I was scared. So when I had that call with the genetic counselor, I almost felt like a secret shopper because they did such a good job. Um, and then we have a medicine in your DNA report that you actually get results back about medicine in your DNA. And that result can be printed out, giving you instructions on how to talk to your doctor about those findings. Yeah, it's pretty cool and pretty, we, we really did that the right way. Yeah, yeah. yeah that sounds great, yeah. great. I think there was a couple more questions coming. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna go ahead? Jennifer? Speed, yeah, yeah, go for it. So um, this, this is so exciting to, to have such an understanding of health disparities. So how do we get to the point of saying, okay, we know there's a health disparity. How do you run clinical trials and invest treatment in addressing those disparities? Because I imagine that's way more expensive than gathering the data. It is. One of the things I say is that place and space matters with our clinical trials. When you look at a lot of the cancer studies that have been done, particularly these large, big studies, they've been done at amazing academic medical institutions. I don't want to take anything away from them, but they have not always been done at community clinics. So we were intentional about partnering with federally qualified health centers and community health centers. So one of the things that I, I actually, my first career was in clinical trials. So I was a clinical trial designer. I helped design clinical trials, and then I helped run clinical trials and stand up clinics to do clinical trials. And the one thing that always was a big issue in the equity was also the inclusion-exclusion criteria. The way the study was designed, no matter where you conducted it, but just from the design of that study, it often excluded populations. It sometimes excluded women because we asked questions about reproductive health that unintentionally excluded women when it, not, it should not have. And so in 1993, then President Clinton came out with the NIH Revitalization Act, which talks about equity and inclusion in clinical trials, and that's, that, that is, keeps evolving. So one of the things I say for equity in clinical trials is trial design. Thinking about, are we designing the study in a way that will unintentionally exclude certain populations? Is that study taking place in communities where people have opportunities to enroll? So going through clinicaltrials.gov to see where this study is taking place, and then sending an email saying, hey, I don't see any sites in this particular area where this study is taking place. And I know that there's a high level of kidney disease in this community, but yet there's not one study site for this new amazing study looking at you know, renal disease and looking at a mutation in a certain you know, APOE1 gene and how that may impact chronic kidney disease. You know, so we have to be advocates for where clinical trials take place and the design of them. I think oh, we're here for oh, yeah. Mike. Yeah, good. So uh, thank you, Dr. Watson, uh, for this overview. This is a great resource. So my question is more about you already have been collecting great amount of data. What is next for all of us in terms of the new data types and potential new variables? Great question. Um, what's next for all of us? We, our goal is to get to the million, but as we get to the million, our chief medical officer, Dr. Jeff Ginsburg, is already thinking about new data types that we will be collecting. Fitbit was a huge 
the type of data for us to collect, but there were some things we had to put in place to not create more digital divides with Fitbit. So we had to actually ask our participants if you had access to a Fitbit. If not, we provided it to you for free and to a certain amount of our participants. The next thing is I really think what's going to be on the horizon for us next is how we deal with mental health data as well as how we deal with data from populations that are not able to provide informed consent, populations that are living, our aging population, populations with disabilities, um, but populations that may need a consent by proxy. That's going to be a new area of data, but also environmental health data. we got to find a way to collect better environmental health data. So I have some ideas, and I've run those ideas by our scientific team because I've seen some cool bands that you wear, these silicone bands that actually collect environmental health data. I want us to get those bands. I'm putting it out there, I'm throwing it out there, I'm just saying. I've been told though that the bands are really expensive, not to get, the bands are cheap in themselves. What's expensive is the processing of the data from, from those bands. But we, we always find a way to, to find the money, so. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. Hi, Kareem. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, informative presentation. Your research is really relevant to mine, um, and I was really excited to hear about your research because we just got funded from the NHLDI on the genetic risk factors for cardiovascular diseases and modifiable lifestyle factors that could that could sort of disconnect the genetic risks for cardiovascular health. And part of our um, work is to create user data, like public use data products um, called polygenic risk scores mm -hmm. for. Uh, for different phenotypic outcomes. So we have um, seven different cardiovascular biomarkers, and we we produce polygenic risk scores for um, European ancestry, African ancestry, and Hispanic ancestry. And we do know, we are very acutely aware that UK Biobank or larger data sets of white individuals um, will yield a lot better results um, as opposed to African ancestry or Hispanic ancestry, which is about 75% predictive. Um, so what do you think are the implications of these different um, data availability or data sets that specifically focus on African industry or Hispanic ancestry, which is pretty difficult and admixed, um, and, and, and in terms of like practical, ethical, and scientific? Points of view. That's a big question. Thank you. And thank, I mean, <laughs> just thinking together. 14. Okay. Um, and, I'm, and I don't mean that in a, a hyperbole way. That's a big question. It really and it's such an important question. I will start off by saying we partner with the UK Biobank. So actually, people from the UK Biobank are actually on our advisory team because we have to do this together, right? The other thing is to understand the ethical implications of um, making sure that we don't conflate race and ancestry and making sure that we don't create unintentional polarizing research, where some bad actors may be able to take this data and create narratives that are not true based on data. You know, we also have to really be mindful of the bad actors in this space. So we have a research access board that talks about that. But it's really going to be about making sure that, that you use multiple data sets to compare. And what we're encouraging researchers to do is to do validation studies and comparison studies between the UK Biobank, where you may have been looking at some risk scores from that and then compare it to our data set. And then you may have to run them a couple years later too as our data set gets larger. Question here? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Amy I think the, yeah. Dr. Roundtree, yeah. Amy Roundtree Research. Um, two questions. First of which is, I noticed that you mentioned how your participants are actually partners as well in your pu uh, publications, et cetera. But are they in data governance, data uh, management, Data ownership, that's the first question. The second is about environmental uh, health and improving the data that you collect there. Have you used citizen science models to, to not just collect things passively from Fitbits and whatnot, but also activating uh, and training and activating uh, citizens in the collection of the data? I want to start with the last question first. I'm actually, my research portfolio is majority citizen scientists. So my R01 was actually used, leveraging, I engaged these African-American men as the barbers. They actually were on my IRB. They could consent their, their, um, their clients. They actually were part of my data governance. All, all the barbers that I engaged with, were, they were put through a citizen scientist training program that the University of Florida developed. We did three cohorts of them. And so that actually sits at the heart of my work. 
Now, how are we doing that in our program? We're trying to use the Ignite model and these data sandboxes to use the citizen scientist model. And we use citizen and community science models for that. We need to do better with that with environmental health, and I'm gonna slowly keep nudging my peers to, to think about that citizen scientist model. Data sovereignty is a different question. Because, yes, they are part in data governance because they're on an IRB and they think about that. But this whole concept of ownership of data is a, is a new area that as the federal government going to have to think about what that looks like. What's a great opportunity for us in this space is our work with tribal and American Indian Alaska Native communities. Because we have to adhere to tribal sovereignty and how we leverage, engage, and utilize that data. And so my hope is that as we learn more about how to adhere to principles of tribal sovereignty, getting the approval from those tribal leaders, going through their IRB, not just our, our IRB, our central IRB, but going through the IRB of that local tribe and that community, getting that approval, and then talking about data ownership from that. that. So I think that what we learned from our tribe, and we're in a series of tribal consultations, we've had three to date and we have them ongoing about our use of AI, American and Alaska Native data. I think that's going to inform a lot of, of data sovereignty when it comes to that. But um, participants have a lot of questions, and our consent process is one of the largest and most complex consent processes, but it's that way for a reason. You have to go through multiple steps of approval, including the video consent, that really talks about this concept of data ownership and, and, and what that looks like. So I'm hoping, I think community, universe, I think institutions are going to play a big role in this. Because you all could get things like SBIRs, Small Business Innovative Research Grants, to support bringing that community in as a partner with you, as a citizen scientist, and talking about how do we continue to spark research even after our grants are over. Interesting. That's a good idea. Last, last question. Yeah. Hi, sorry. Dr. Watson, thank you for the talk. Um, Carolyn Chang, Academic Services and College of Science and Engineering. Um, what I've heard you share with us today is a lot of information about how clinical research is growing in terms of um, the types of data that's being collected, the places that clinical research is happening. Um, and my question to you is um, how, I'm going to preface that by saying in the state of Texas, um, our AMCs, our academic medical centers, are not affiliated with undergraduate um, education. And so what role do you think place, institutions like Texas State University have in training the future clinical workforce um, as we're seeing the growth in what the portfolio of clinical research is including now? You, I mean, you all at the epicenter of it. I mean, I don't think we can do it without institutions like Texas State and, and others. I come from a, a state institution that was an HSI, a minority service institution. Because the beautiful thing that you have, we were talking about this, is that many of your students are going to go back to their communities and take what they learn here back to that community. That's going to move quicker than the speed of research. What they learn here is going to be a speed of implementation science. Because they're going to take these innovations, these evidence-based best practices back to their community and implement those things and be a part of that workforce. That's why it's so important for us to have the follow-up conversation after this talk today, because we can't stop here. We have to roll our sleeves up and say, how do we ensure that the students and the faculty can utilize our workbench for real problem solving, for, you know, for real implementation <coughs> science? And think about that, because you will see students from college engineering, computer science, and you know, um, even, even you know, history that are thinking about, um, from an anthropological perspective, thinking about how to, how to do research. We need to make sure those students are trained and engaged in a way that allows them to answer questions that they see back in their communities when they go home. That's what I did. My whole research career was informed by what I saw in my community. I knew how to work with barbers because I spent every Saturday at the barbershop. I knew how to work with faith leaders because I spent every Wednesday and Friday and Sunday at church. And so, but I, took, I take that back to my community, right? And so that's what we need more of is taking this information back to the communities where we come from. Well, I think you'll all agree. I, I, been excited and am excited about the prospects of all of us, not only for myself and for us as researchers, but for every, for all of us who will benefit from this um, program and the data that's going to come from it that can actually help help improve health outcomes for everybody. And so I could twist all your arms and one by one try to convince you that we as an institution needs to pursue this and, and find ways to um, implement programs and write grants and do research that is related to the All of Us program. But um, I hope that 
listening to Dr. Watson, you're more convinced than ever that we are going to keep this going. And we do want to pursue this. And I do think that not only do we need to do it because, um, you know, it's a good opportunity for ourselves, but, uh, but for our students and for all of the 222 counties across Texas where they, many of them will go back and they have the ability to have impact as health providers or health professionals or business owners or you know people doing geography and figuring out what places matter yeah, for yeah. studying these things. Yeah. There's a million ways that we as an institution can have an impact from this program. So very excited about this and we will keep it going. So stay tuned. I cannot thank you enough for joining us. <laughs>